it's okay. So come on, draw close. Oh, so welcome, family, friends. We're gathered today to honor the passing of James S. B. Green. I tell you, it's a real, it's a real pleasure and thrill to see all these generations come out for for James, James's uh, funeral. Uh, it's heartwarming, uh, and it it just shows that life goes on. That he's done his contributed to this world and passed on and look what he's left behind his health of course you all know had been failing for a long time and peace has descended upon him at last and he has gone to dwell in the arms of divine love itself Khalil Gibran says in the prophet you would know the secret of death, but how shall you find it unless you seek it in the heart of life? If you would indeed behold the spirit of death, open your heart wide unto the body of life. For life and death are one, even as the river and the sea are one. For what is it to die but to stand naked in the wind and to melt into the sun? And what is it to cease breathing but to free the breath from its restless tides, that it may rise and expand and seek God unencumbered. Jim joined the Navy at 17, just at the end of World War II. It's time for him to return to the, to the great sea that embraces all life. And from John Maysfield's sea, sea fever. He says, I must go down to the sea again, to the lonely sea and the sky, and all I ask is a tall ship and a star to steer for by. And the wheels kick and the winds song and the white sails shaking, and a gray mist on the sea's face and a gray dawn breaking. I must go down to the sea again, for the call of the running tide is a wild call and a clear call that may not be denied. And all I ask is a windy day with the white clouds flying and the flung spray and the blown spume and the seagulls crying. I must go down to the sea again, to the vagrant gypsy life, to the gull's way and the whale's way where the wind's like a wetted knife. And all I ask is a merry yarn from a laughing fellow rover, a quiet sleep and a sweet dream when the long trek's over. We come to remember James, Jim, and uh, to James Thomas, we'll give the eulogy. Thank you. Thank you, Reverend Hamilton. Family, friends, guests, welcome. I am James Thomas Green. Thank you for coming to this memorial for James S. B. Green. Who some of you knew as Jim, Jimmy, Grandpa, Great Grandpa, Brother, Uncle, Cousin, Friend, and to me, his eldest son. I called him variously Father, Pa, Father Figure, Popple, Me Papa, Daddy Saurus, and many other silly terms of affection. But most of all, James S. B. Green is my dad. <laughs> I am here to speak a brief eulogy in honor of my father, my dad, and I shall tell you what dad was like. I shall give you an abridged autobiography of dad. I shall speak of the relationship I had with dad, and I shall tell you what dad's legacy means to me, as well as what his legacy means to us all. I've been very shaken up these past few days, and I shall endeavor to make it through this eulogy without breaking up too much, so please forgive me if I need to stop occasionally to compose myself. Dad was born in Heber Springs, Arkansas on April 26, 1927 to Thomas Alton Green and Florine Jenny McCord Green in the home of his maternal grandparents, 
James Buchanan McCord and Mary Catherine Beach McCord. Dad had a silly sense of humor and he te loved to tell goofy jokes and laughs. He would often burst out into spontaneous silly song. Dad loved to fish, although for the most part he didn't really like to eat fish. He let the rest of the family do that for him and since I like fish, that was no problem for me. He loved to go on long drives in the countryside and he would often go on by himself when he could drive. And uh, later, when I was the driver, he enjoyed the scenery. Dad loved horses, probably because when he was a boy, his grandfather kept horses. When we went on those long drives, he'd get excited when we saw horses in the fields. He liked to go out in the desert and shoot bottles and cans with a small pistol or rifle. He loved trains and would go on and on about the locomotives he saw in person or on television. He preferred things simple. He would prefer a fast food hamburger to any sort of more exotic meal. Dad made friends easily and could charm almost anyone. When I went to various events where the people knew Dad when he wasn't with me, I would always be asked about how he was doing and why he wasn't there. I used to tell Dad he was the most popular person not at the party. Dad worked on the railroad between Kansas City and Arkansas in the summer between his junior and senior years of high school, and at summer 1944's end, Dad was offered a full-time railroad job, but instead he decided to finish high school and graduated from Jacksonville High School in Little Rock, Arkansas in 1945. Although Dad had a full basketball scholarship to the University of Arkansas, where he would have majored in history, Dad instead joined the U.S. Navy at age 17 during the waning days of World War II. Uh, Dad had to convince his reluctant father to sign the documents to allow him to enlist in the Navy as a minor in 1945, which he did. Dad never saw combat in World War II as uh, the war ended before he could be shipped into a war zone. Because of Dad's literacy and uh, ability to do some typing, after completing boot camp in San Diego, the Navy forced Dad to become a yeoman, a sort of administrative assistant or secretary, although Dad protested as best he could because he wanted some other non-office-bound uh, job. Dad is a nuclear veteran. He was on the first naval survey sh ship to visit Bikini Atoll several months after the first post-nuclear weapons test uh, called, nuclear, uh, called Operation Crossroads. Dad, like many other sailors, initially ate the fresh coconuts growing on Bikini Atoll until several days after arrival when the command ordered the sailors to STOP EATING THOSE RADIOACTIVE COCONUTS! <laughs> Dad received an honorable discharge as a yeoman third class in uh, 1948. While Dad served in the Navy, his family moved from Arkansas to Salinas, and Dad followed them there after discharge. There he met my mother, Joan Vivian DeWolf, and they were married on July 6, 1951. My parents went on to have three children, me, James Thomas Green, my little brother, there he is, and uh, my baby sister, Judy, <coughs> Mom told me that when she told Dad that she was pregnant with me, he was so happy and excited he did somersaults. I suspect that was an exaggeration. They bought a house in 1957, just a couple of years before I came along, and Dad lived there until his passing. In addition to getting married in Salinas, Dad initially worked in the lettuce fields where he helped make produce boxes and he loved to work out in the fields in the sunshine. He thought that was so much fun. Dad became a correctional officer at Soledad Prison and retired there as a correctional sergeant and then went on to a second career as a uh, correctional lieutenant at the uh, prison in Jean, Nevada, from which he retired a second time. Dad's final career was as a security guard at Salinas Valley Memorial Hospital, from where Dad retired a third and final time following the passing of his wife, 
Joan, my mother, who is buried right here under this pile of dirt. I'm sure she wouldn't like that. <laughs> um, after 21 years, she's finally going to have company. <laughs> A few weeks after mom's passing from cancer, I was diagnosed with cancer, and the initial prognosis was grim. There was only a slight chance I'd survive more than a few years, and I was only 34. I prepared to die. I went some, through some very dark times, and I gained a view of life and eternity that most young adults never contemplate at that early part of their life. The news that Dad might lose a child, coming just a few weeks after losing his wife, crushed him. Dad had gone with me to the hospital, and when I told him it's cancer, he slumped back against the hospital hall wall and started crying. <laughs> Dad took care of me in the months and years afterwards, and I owe much of my current existence to him. New medical science had come along that made the previous survival statistics invalid, but having Dad's support definitely enabled my survival. And had it not for Dad, I would probably not be here now. For a few years, there was no sign of the return. After, when there was no sign of the return of my cancer, I gained increasing confidence that I was actually going to live. And then I began to reboot my life. Then, in 2000, Dad had open heart bypass surgery. The operation was successful, but Dad got an infection called Orsa. And he grew sicker and sicker until several days after the operation, he slipped into a coma. I was by his side as much as I could be in the next few months. I talked to him, and I squeezed his arms and shoulders and patted him. I did whatever I could to communicate with him, to let him know I was there and I wasn't going to leave. Dad's granddaughter, Larissa, had been born just a few months before that. And uh, I told him as he was in his coma that they were going to, he's going to wake up and the two of them are going to learn to walk together. And that someday he would go to her high school graduation. Dad and Larissa did indeed learn to walk at about the same time. And as Larissa is currently a freshman in high school, Dad almost made it to her graduation. I refused to let the hospital disconnect life support until they could prove, with scientific evidence, that Dad would not recover. I was determined to stand by him in his crisis, as he had stood by me in mine. <laughs> However, physically and biologically, I couldn't stay by his side all the time. I had to live my life outside of Dad's crisis, so to enable a virtual presence of me for Dad, I made an audio CD with music, brief sound clips, and audio clips of me telling him a lot of different things, including such things as, your name is James S.B. Green, you're in the hospital, you had open heart surgery, because who thinks of these things, you know? The guy wakes up and, you know, he's like, where am I? And, you know, it was uh, on a repeat, so the stuff would go to him. One of the clips is I gave him permission to go if he had to. But the most, perhaps the most important one was uh, uh, an instruction for him to respond to questions by nodding his head up and down for yes and back and forth for no. That gave Dad a binary output to enable him to answer yes or no questions. Now this might sound obviously simple, but I had this vision of my father being asked questions and he's got a tracheotomy tube in his throat and he's trying to talk and he's not even thinking about speaking. In fact, he was like that in the hospital just a few days ago when he had the BiPAP mask on. Um, it worked. Within a few days of the start of playing the CD, Dad came out of the coma and showed that, yes, he was still there by the yes and no answers that he gave. Um, the lights had come back on. Dad recovered slowly, and it was not apparent for a long time he would ever go home, but home he eventually went. And he came back to us and has had almost and had almost an extra 15 years in which he could love 
and be loved. After Dad came home, I pushed him hard to keep him functional. For example, I took him walking in places like the Fort Ord BLM lands, uh, and I'd take him to Northridge Mall. We'd walk up and down the mall, and until just a few months ago, he was able to walk all the way through Northridge Mall and back with his walker and oxygen. He was tough. Um, I would usually not help him get out of chairs unless he had tried and showed that he couldn't do it. Um, frequently when we were in public, I would get dirty looks from strangers as I watched Dad struggling to get up from a chair. And it wasn't because I was lazy or mean. I wanted him to get up. It's like how uh, Stephen Hawking, the paralyzed physicist, um, before he became totally physicist, uh, totally paralyzed, his wife had him crawl up the stairs by himself. And visitors thought that that, he, that was cruel at first, but it kept him moving longer than he might have otherwise. Dad had uh, many serious and long-term chronic health problems in his final years and was repeatedly in and out of hospitals, at least once a year or so, usually. But he consistently made liars out of the medical personnel by surviving, even when several times his, repeat, his survival was repeatedly declared helpless. He beat the odds and just fought through it. I got to where I was calling Dad Lazarus, but a friend in, informed me that Lazarus only came back <laughs> once. So La Dad is more of a Lazarus cat. However, there inevitably came a point at which neither Dad nor I could hold on any longer. And it became clear there was no longer any rational reason to hope or believe that Dad would pull another Lazarus kitty out of a hat. And enough scientific evidence was presented by his doctors and medical personnel. I finally gave permission for them to let Dad go. Dad passed peacefully, surrounded by his loving and attentive extended family at Salinas Valley Memorial Hospital this last Monday, May 4th, 2015, at about 5.50 in the afternoon. On the bright side, Dad is no longer suffering. Dad never got to the point where he could not walk at all until the last few weeks. Dad never developed any sort of dementia. He knew who he was, he knew where he was, and what was happening around him, and he knew his loving family was surrounding him until the very end. I want to end this eulogy by considering Dad's legacy. How do we measure the life of any person? What are the factors we should consider in evaluating anyone's legacy? Should we consider how much money they had? How many houses, how many cars, how much jewelry? Were they famous? Should someone's end point be the most important thing we consider in evaluating their entire life? In my humble opinion, I believe the most important factor in someone's legacy ultimately is how they affected the people around them during the time when they were among the living. Did they do good? Did they give support and comfort when they could? Did they leave people better off afterwards than they were before? By these standards, Dad has left an awesome legacy. Not only for myself, but for his extended fam family gathered here and elsewhere. And uh, the many friends and just random people he met through his long and spectacular life. At 88, he had at least 15 years more than he probably should have. And you can't say that he died an early death. That's not the tragedy of his passing. In the end, the end point is not what determines the measure of a person. And I say that Dad's lifetime legacy is tremendous. To all those whom he touched with his wisdom, humor, and good nature. The living part of Dad's legacy is now complete, and his legacy is now entrusted to all of us to keep Jimmy Green's memory alive 
and to pass on his legacy to the future and future generations. I will carry Dad's legacy with me until my own end moments. And I request and hope that all of you will do the same. Now, I ask that we all take 60 seconds of silent contemplation, as measured by this timer, so I don't sit there and go, oh, when's, he gonna, when's it over? To think about the life of James S.B. Green, my dad. Think about what he meant to you, what he meant to us, and what he will continue to mean in the future to us as his afterlife now begins. We shall now begin our silent contemplation. I shall now turn the podium back to Reverend Dennis Hamilton for the conclusion of this memorial ceremony for James S.B. Green, my dad. This is the time that if you'd like to say something, now's the time that you can just turn around and, and say it to everybody. You don't have to come up here. Is there anything John or Joey that you'd like to say? Mary Oliver says, look, the trees are turning their own bodies into pillars of light, are giving off the rich fragrance of cinnamon and fulfillment. The long tapers of cattails are bursting and floating away over the blue shoulders of the ponds. And every pond, no matter what its name, is nameless now. Every year, everything I have ever learned in my lifetime leads back to this. The fires in the black river of loss, whose other side is salvation, whose meaning none of us alive will ever know. To live in this world, you must be able to do three things. To love what is mortal, to hold it against your bones, knowing your own life depends on it. And when time comes to let it go, to let it go. That time is, is here to have Jimmy joined his beloved wife of 43 years, and she's been waiting for 21 years for, for him to, to join her. And so we can give our blessings on that, on him. So let us pray. The source of all, beyond life and death, we commend Jim Green back to you. Jim is a faithful and loving man. He earned his keep loved his family, lived a good life. Now his struggle with health has ended and he returns to you, O oh God, the source of all life. So to you, his family, to remain to remember him, may he always be with you in the wind and the sun's warmth. May 
I visit you in the cool drops of rain soothing the earth, and the flowers that remember every spring. And may he be safe in your hearts at rest and in your embrace and alive in your memories to the end of your days. And when you look around and see this family, the people and the friends that he's affected, the friendship that he's extended, the love, and the progeny, remember him. May he never be forgotten. And now peace, O oh hearts, and let the time of parting be sweet. Let it not be a death, but completeness. Let love melt into memory and pain into song. And stand still, O oh Anne, for a moment to say your last words in silence. So for just a moment, pray, pray the prayer of your heart for, for Jim as he, as he departs. Rest in peace, Jim. So it is. Amen. That's all.